Hey, time for the young and heart to come on up. Come on up, we still want another seat right there. There we go. Good to see you, Samuel. Good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for coming. Well, today uh, we're going to be talking about storytelling. Do you like a good story? Do you like a good story? Do you have a favorite? Something that your mom and dad read you or something? I like to read comic books. Comic books, okay. <laughs> Everybody likes story? Well, we're going to be talking about being a storyteller. How would you like to be a Would you like to be a storyteller? Would you? Or you're going to get Mickey's. He's shaking his head. Okay. Well, we're going to work on that, Mickey. We're going to work on that. Okay, but uh, storytelling. In fact, we're going to talk about telling the most important story of all time in all the world. You ready to know what that is? The Bible? The whole Bible? You want to tell the whole Bible story? Are you you're willing to be here for the next year? Yeah. But we're what we're going to do, we're going to take a, a summary a summary of the best story in here. The best story in here. And I want each of you, I want each of you to work at this story because over the next few weeks, I might call you up here to be a storyteller on that story. You ready, Nikki? <laughs> well, this story, it is the greatest love story ever told. And how many people do you think need to hear the story? Come on up to the treasure chest. Yeah. Ooh, black lava. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yes. Wouldn't it be good to tell? Because when, when you hear stories, some people like the stories, other people don't. But you know what? The story that we're going to be talking about is for everybody. God wants this story told to everybody. Everybody. So I want each of you to become a storyteller. Will you do that for me? Yeah. In fact, I'm going to give you a chance today to be a storyteller. But you might be saying right now, oh, Dr. Mittman, but I can't read very well. Guess what? This story doesn't have any words in, in that we have to read. It's like a, a wordless story. Yeah? So, Nikki, you can do this one easy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, all of you can do this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it is. You might earn one of these today. You might earn one of these by telling the story. Yeah, are you ready? Well, the story starts with just a, a gold dot right in the middle. Just right there. Do you see it? Do you see the gold dot? Everybody see the gold dot? Yeah. That gold dot, you know what that represents? Now listen carefully to Dr. Mittman so you can tell the story. Okay. The gold dot represents God's kingdom. Up in heaven, it is made out of yeah, gold. gold. Come on up to the treasure chest. All right, yeah. Okay, well, how many want to go to that city of gold? Yeah, everybody wants to go to that city of gold. But we have a big problem. You know what that big problem is? We are restricted to go there because you have, in fact, everybody has a sinful, dark Heart. Do you see that heart? Yeah, let's get it up here. Let's get it up here. And so with that sinful heart, we can't go to God's city of gold because no sin is allowed in. Can you say that? No sin is allowed in. So are we all in trouble? Yeah, we all have problems, you know. So if, if this is the kind of heart you have, you're not allowed in. You're not allowed in. But God has a plan. Um, God has a plan. You know what he does? He 
came and he died on the cross for whose sin? Our sin, for all of our sin. So let's, let's get it up here, let's get it up here. There it is, that's the cross. And it's red because what did he do on that cross? Yep. He suffered to yeah. he, he, he died on the cross for our sin. And why do you think it's red, maybe? It's because of his blood. Yes, the blood of Jesus was shed. Come on up to the treasure chest. That's why. So Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his Oh, it's a black bottle? Okay. So we have that wonderful, wonderful cross. And guess what that cross does for our black heart? Guess what that black heart, what happens to that black heart? Yes. And what color do you think that might be? Red. You're close. Think something nice and clean. White. Oh, white. A white heart. Okay. A white heart. That's it. Come on up. Come on up to the treasure chest. Okay. A white heart. And if we have hearts like this, where do we get to go? We get to go to heaven. You like that? Yeah, it's called the Flipper Flapper. Yeah, it's put out by Child Evangelism Fellowship, the Flipper Flapper. Who would like to earn a Flipper Flapper this morning by telling us the story? Now, I have these smaller versions, okay? I have these smaller versions, all right? And so you start off, remember, with the city of gold, that's God's kingdom, but not everyone can go there because everyone has what? Black. A black heart, which means a black. sinful heart. But then God sent who to die on the cross? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for us. And when we believe in him and put our faith in him, what does he do? He cleanses our hearts and makes them as white as snow as white as snow and if we have a nice white clean heart we get to go where to heaven, to heaven. that's right who wants to be okay. who wants to be our storyteller this morning who wants to be our storyteller now i'm going to give you the bigger version here to be our storyteller do you okay bella you want to come up you want to do it okay you take the flipper flapper. So I want you guys to practice this, okay? I want you to practice it on your parents and, and uh, you can go, I'm gonna tell it, uh, go to your mommy and daddy and say, I'm gonna tell you a story tonight. And you can tell them the story using the flipper flapper. Yeah, okay, now I'm gonna get a mic and I'm gonna hold it, but I want you to use the flipper flapper to tell the story, okay? And if we ask him to forgive us and believe that he died for our sins, what happens to our heart? He turns it to a white heart. Can you show us? Oh, here's the light. How many like that white heart? Yeah.
And that looks like what? Oh, okay. I, I need Bella. I think Bella has more earned her uh, flipper flapper, don't you? There you go, Bella. Okay, now with those smaller ones, be real careful. They're delicate, okay? But learn to tell that story. I'm, we're going to have enough time just for one more. Who wants to be the storyteller? Who wants to be it? Okay, Izzy, come on. Up. Let me get back to the beginning. Here you go. The story that is God's heaven that you can't get to it because it has a black heart. And if you have a black heart, then it is sin. But he asked Die for our sins, and then he will give us a clean heart and take away to his Whoa. Heart. The greatest story ever told by Izzy. Izzy, you just learned to earn yourself a flipper flapper. All right, well, okay, does every family have one now? Okay, so you can practice for next week. Do you want to try it? No? Samuel, you want to try it? Samuel, come on up here. I want every family, at least this next week, to have a flipper flapper so you can practice it. And then uh, in, the, in the next few weeks, I might call on you uh, to come up here. And Nikki, I'm looking right at you. You want to tell the greatest story in the world, don't you? Okay, Samuel, come on. Come over here. What does the gold mean? Okay. Can't go to heaven without. We okay. Here we go. Just unfold it here. There we go. Because what's what's uh, what's why can't you go to heaven? Because you have a black heart. And what does that stand for? What makes it black? Um, sin. Sin, okay. How do you get rid of it? Um, you go to heaven? Well, before you go to heaven, you gotta get rid of your sinful heart. How do you do that? Um, you don't remember? Open it up. Open it up. What do you see? Who died on the cross? God. Yeah, what's his name? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. And uh, if what do you have to do to get a white heart? Um, yeah. Who do you pray to? God. Yeah, and who's that? Jesus. Yeah, and then if, when he forgives you, you get what? You get to go to where? Okay, that's pretty good. All right, the rest of you, you're gonna have to earn your flipper flappers. Okay, yeah, Tyler, that means you. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. But the greatest story is a simple story. But what it took, the price that it took to put it into place is is uh, unbelievable, but you did it. You came and died on the cross for our sins so that we could have perfect, clean hearts. And uh, thank you that you're keeping your kingdom perfect. It is a perfect place for all eternity that we'll be able to enjoy, and we're looking forward to that. Thank you for being our marvelous God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We should get the kids back.
<laughs> hey kids, come on back here. Cena, bring them back here. I forgot, I want to sing a song. I love it. You remember the song, I love to tell the story? Yeah. Let's belt it out, okay? Let's belt it out, okay? We're gonna sing one more song before you guys go, and it's up here. I love to tell the story. Here we go. And the words will be up. Everybody, let's sing. Revelation, and uh, today we're going to be taking a peek into chapter 12, just a few verses of chapter 12 today. It is still the interlude. Remember, uh, we started an interlude back in chapter 10, and uh, then we also had chapter 11. Chapter 12 will be the same thing. Chapter 13 will be more detail on the Antichrist, and chapter 14 is more detail. But uh, in chapter 15, that's where we actually see the seven bowls of judgment being poured out. But we're going to take a peek in chapter 12 today because it's dealing with a very important topic, and that is the war. The war. I put this picture together because uh, it not only depicts the real war that's going on, right now. But it also depicts what's happening over in the Ukraine. Here's a, a, lot, a, a recent picture of a lady that just lost everything, including some of her family members, uh, as a result of the war. So today's sermon is entitled, The War. And you will soon see that the war has been going on for a long, 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 long time. But we're going to take a look at what the war has done uh, this morning. So uh, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to start in verse 7, Revelation chapter 12. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to the other verses, but the main focus of the sermon today is the war. Because when we understand the war, and the main character on the opposition side, which is Lucifer and Satan, we need to do a theological study today of Lucifer. We need to understand this uh, angelic being called Satan and the devil. We need to understand him, and when we do that, we're going to understand Revelation 12 a whole lot better, and in fact, the rest of the book of Revelation, we're going to have a good grip on there. But let's start here in Revelation 12, starting in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, 
Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Verse 12. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Before we pray, I just want to highlight two parts to this verse, because we're going to see this extreme separation through the rest of the book of Revelation. And that is this. There's a group in heaven. Rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Turn to the person next to you. If they're a believer, they're part of that group. Because this is talking about uh, there's a group up in heaven, and that's part of the church. The church is part of that group when it will be raptured up and they will be doing rejoicing. But there's a very opposite side of this. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. We've seen that over and over again, haven't we? The inhabitants of the earth. And every time it's used, it's in reference to the unbelievers, unbelievers on planet earth. So uh, rejoice for you that dwell in heaven, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. The devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would be with us today. Lord, we want to leave this place different than when we came in because we have spent uh, the next moments with you and your everlasting word. Oh Lord, prepare our hearts to uh, be molded and shaped by your Holy Spirit with your everlasting word. Sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. While there was war in heaven, going back to verse 7, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we're looking at the great dragon, and we're, we have a, a much fuller perspective of who he is because of the expanded name. Uh, Jesus, uh, here in his word, is calling him the great dragon. And the great dragon, we were introduced to that name if we read the first few verses in chapter 12, uh, especially in verse 3, we would have been introduced already to the great red dragon, Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder. Whenever you hear that, see that word wonder in the Bible, and here in this chapter we see it a couple of times, it's talking about a sign. There's a sign in heaven. So this is another reason why we take the book of Revelation literally. Unless God tells us there's a special sign or an analogy to be taken. And then if we see an analogy or a character, is this the way Satan really looks? No, he's not a dragon, but he behaves like a dragon. That's his behavior. And God wants to warn us, this angel is dangerous. He is like a dragon. And there appeared another sign or wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Now, whenever God gives signs or analogies, remember what uh, I taught you months ago. Always let Scripture interpret Scripture. If there's a, a sign or a wonder, God doesn't want to leave us confused. And so we have the interpretation of who this great red dragon is here in verse 9. If you just read a little bit further down in the chapter, we have the answer right away. And the great dragon was cast out. Now he tells us 
that old serpent. That takes us way back to the very beginning. And that's where we're headed this morning. We need to look at that old serpent to understand really his character and his qualities. He's called the devil and Satan. And what's his task? And he's very good at it. Who deceives the whole world. If you're part of the whole world, raise your hand. Okay, that's us. That's us. He deceives the whole world. So uh, we notice that that is, uh, comes right after verse 7, which uh, speaks of there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels. Oh, yeah. You see, Lucifer, he's an angel. And we'll find that out in just a minute. But he took one-third of the angels. He is so strong that he was able to take one-third of the heavenly angels with him when he was fallen, when he was cast down. So he does have an angel force behind him. One third of the heavenly hosts fell with him. But you know, it's interesting that uh, when, when uh, Lucifer fell, and we'll look at that in just a minute, that his angels fell right along with him. They were fooled by Lucifer. They really thought that Lucifer was going to take control of heaven. They really thought that Lucifer was going to be on God's throne. And so they followed Lucifer. That's how deceiving Lucifer was. He was uh, very good at what he did. Now today, when it says his angels, Lucifer's angels, uh, we, we call them demons today. Demons today are nothing else than fallen angels. But I like, uh, I like stories of war. I'll admit that. And, and my favorite, of course, is Star Wars. Uh, I have a, a weakness for watching any Star Wars, and, and any time Disney comes out with a new Star Wars, I'm going to be watching it. I, I love the series. But here we are told there is a real Star Wars. There's a real Star Wars. And we're going to be taking a closer look at that because if we do and if we understand the characters in this war and that it is presently going on, we are in the war right now, right now as I speak. Um, and uh, the war is, is, uh, has been going on uh, before the foundation of the world, really. Before Adam and Eve, that's when Lucifer fell. But we have the war between the, the dragon and, uh, and the Holy Spirit, God, uh, and his angels. And so uh, this war is the great war against God. But Lucifer found out that uh, he can hurt God more ways than just trying to uh, fight God's angels up in heaven because he know he lost already with that. But he's come down to earth because there are those who are made in God's image. And if he can cause havoc there, he wants to do it. And he's doing a pretty good job of it, isn't he? He really is. He really is. So uh, we're going to go back to the beginning, the very beginning, and uh, let's look at what Ezekiel has to say. We're going to do a little theological study on who Satan, Lucifer, was. Uh, in Ezekiel 28, he's called uh, Lucifer the anointed cherub. And the cherub is a type of angel. We have seraphim up in heaven. We have cherubim up in heaven. They're a, a unique type of angel, and he was the anointed cherub. There was something extra special about him, and we'll learn that here in this text. But in Ezekiel 28, verse 12 and 13, we read, Thus saith the Lord God, he's speaking to Lucifer, and he says, You seal up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That was part of his problem. Out of all the angels, God made him more beautiful than all the other angels. And he may have exalted himself as a result of that. 
But not only was he beautiful, but he, had, he was full of wisdom. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The zardus, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and of your flutes was prepared in you in the day that you were what? Amen. Say it again. Amen. Make sure that when uh, a Mormon comes knocking at your door and wants to introduce you uh, to Mormonism, uh, you can tell them that the Jesus of Mormonism is not a spirit brother of Lucifer. Okay, even though Jesus and Lucifer in Mormonism are spirit brothers. But here, it's very clear. What does scripture say? Lucifer was what? Created, Created by who? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is God. Lucifer was not, okay? But he is a created being. And so Lucifer, he is the anointed cherub. He was perfect in his ways. Sealed up the sum of wisdom. I mean, this is one smart angel. God poured his wisdom into this angel. Precious stones covered him. He was arrayed in beauty, absolute beauty. He's not the fire-breathing uh, Im Halloween image that we have painted of Lucifer today. He doesn't have a pitchfork and he doesn't breathe out fire. He is a beautiful, beautiful creature created by God. And uh, he's perfect in beauty. Notice that. When it comes to beauty, the Bible says he's perfect in beauty. His essence radiated music. There were timbrels and flutes built into He did not need a sound system. When he led the other angels in worship to God, Music radiated from his essence. He didn't need any stereo system of any kind. His body radiated music. And I'm sure it was perfect music. Perfect music. But uh, later on in verse 15 in Ezekiel 28, this is what we find. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were what? Again, created. Till iniquity was found in you. Iniquity. Until iniquity was found in you. So we, uh, we go to Isaiah chapter 14, 12 and 13 to find out how that iniquity was formulated and what happened. What was the result of that? And so God here addresses Lucifer again in Isaiah. And he says, how are you fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground? Who did weaken the nations? Isn't he good at that? He has been weakening the nations since the, the foundation of the world. He's been after people, weakening families weakening individuals. He's just a, a king. Um, it says, for you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above God. As soon as he wanted to take God's position, Jesus said, I saw Lucifer fall from heaven. I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. I mean, that was it was just like lightning. See, as quick as lightning, sin cannot be in the presence of the Holy God. He had to be shot out. Uh, and that was his initial fall. That was his initial fall. And as he fell and he's come down to earth, the Bible tells us, he uh, came in contact with a new creation. It was a man and a woman. And he heard, he was observing. Satan observes everything. He was observing 
what is happening with this new creation that God pronounced made in his image. Made in his image. So Satan studied this couple and he realized that uh, there were some things that he could do to bring his war down to earth. And so Satan brought the war to earth and he realized that there is a way that uh, he could uh, mess up God's plan. At least he thought he could mess up God's plan initially and we'll see what happens. So we need to take a look at the original sin and how that came about because that's going to help us understand Lucifer uh, a little bit more, especially when we get to Revelation chapter 13 which is all about the Antichrist and the false prophet. And we're going to see what it means when Lucifer, when Satan, the dragon, gives his power to the Antichrist. And we will understand uh, that, that principle a little bit better when we get to that part. But uh, here, the original sin, we need to take a look at it. You know, this is what God has to say, just in summary, in Genesis chapter 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. How many trees was available to Adam and Eve? Lots and lots of trees. But then he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. One tree. You have a choice of a million trees to choose from, but there's one tree that I want you to stay away from, and don't eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Someone else was listening. Someone else was listening to every word that God said. And that was Lucifer. And he goes, it is at this point that I am going to ruin man and woman. Just going to ruin them. Because his battle, the war, is not over for him. It is not over. And so uh, what the Bible has to say about Adam and Eve, in the last verse in chapter 2, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. There was no sin, no barrier, none whatsoever. They had no concept of nakedness. It wasn't even in, in their mind. It didn't even register. It wasn't there. But uh, Satan brought his war to this couple. And if he could foul this whole uh, arrangement between Adam and Eve, uh, he would befoul the rest of mankind. And so uh, he brings the war to them. The old serpent, the Bible says. Remember what we read in Revelation 12, 9. Called the devil and Satan, and he does what? He deceives the whole world. That's what he specializes in. Well, in Revelation, you know, at the, the last verse in, in uh, chapter 2, is they were both naked and they weren't ashamed. Watch how quickly that changes in five verses. In just five verses, that whole arrangement changes. Watch how it changes. So the old serpent, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. The Bible says, now that serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. Satan took himself and placed himself inside of that snake. And uh, he, uh, he wanted to make that snake interesting. I don't know if you've ever walked into a, a pet shop and uh, had an animal, a parakeet or, or some type of animal, uh, some bird speak to you. It's very fascinating. And so he's very clever. He waits for the woman to be there. So I don't know if that's a, a sign to the girls that they're attracted to speaking animals or not, but that's what's happened here. Uh, Lucifer gets inside the snake, uh, he meets the woman, 
and he begins to speak to her. And the speaking creature, it had the power of speech, which no other of the creatures uh, that she was surrounded with had that power. And so she was fascinated by the very fact that he was speaking. And so the uh, serpent brings out this point. Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? How did he know that? He had heard it. But notice how he already twists things. He takes God's word and twists it away. He twists it to be confusing. He is the ultimate confuser. And so uh, he questions the, the woman. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That right there is, is, is ready a, a twisting of God's word and a lie to God's word. And then he questions who? Who is he questioning who? To the, to the woman. God. He is questioning God with his lies and deceit. The very first question in the Bible is given by Lucifer. The very first question in all the Bible comes from Lucifer. And uh, he's questioning God. He's trying to cast doubt upon God. He's trying to show distrust. Distrust God leads to uh, disobedience. And uh, so we have uh, Lucifer who deceives the whole world as we read in Revelation chapter 12. And he does it by deception. Deception is an act or statement which misleads, hides the truth, or promotes a belief, concept, or an idea that is not true. It is often done for personal gain or advantage. And so, uh, Lucifer, we need to understand a little bit of, uh, of, of his background. You know, a lot of people think that he's, uh, he's a spirit from hell. Presently, Satan is not in hell. In fact, nobody is in the lake of fire. Nobody is in hell at this point. But Lucifer, Lucifer does uh, eventually get cast into hell. He's never been to hell before, but he's going there. And when he does go to hell, he will not be in charge. Uh, and so uh, Lucifer, that is his goal. That is not his goal, but that's God's goal. And his end for Lucifer is that he will be in the fiery uh, lake of fire, Gehenna. But uh, he's not there yet. Presently, Satan spends most of his time in heaven accusing believers before God. See, what we read in chapter 12 in Revelation hasn't happened yet. So he still has access to go up to heaven to accuse us before God. And he accuses us all the time. He's doing that. And he gathers uh, his evidence. He does this with evidence that he continually collects. So uh, he comes to Adam and Eve because he is, as Jesus calls him, the father of lies. In John chapter 8, he is called the father of lies. And here in, in, uh, in Genesis, Satan lies about the character of God, and Satan lies about the word of God. He twists what God said, and he tries to make God look, he lowers God's value and estimation of God in the mind of, of the woman and also of Adam. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Ah, Satan takes that point and immediately comes back Verse 4 of Genesis 3. The serpent said unto the woman, You will not surely die. So right there, another lie. Again, he is the father of lies. And he says, uh, God says, The day that you eat that forbidden fruit, you're going to die. And they did. They died spiritually. Even though they, people go, Well, look, Adam and Eve, they kept on living. Oh, no. Inwardly. Thank you for that answer. Inwardly, okay, inwardly, they died spiritually. They died. It was, it was absolutely dead. But this, the, uh, the serpent says, you know, 
God's holding something from you. You're not going to die. You know, God is withholding some special information that you need to know. You know verse 5. For God, he speaks it with authority now, for God does know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open and you shall be as God. He's always been a God maker. And that's what he does to the coming Antichrist. The coming Antichrist will come to the point and he will stand in the temple and declare himself to be God. And he will demand the world to worship him. That's coming. We have God makers with us today. The Mormon church is nothing but God makers. If you dig into their theology, you will find out that every man within the Mormon church will get his own planet, will become his own God, and start the whole process over again. Sad, but true. And I dare to say that most Mormons do not know what they even believe. They don't even know. But you should be as God, knowing good and evil. You know, Satan comes always as a neutral, he's, he's pretending to be a neutral observer and to act in benefit of Eve. You know, God is holding something special from you. You know, that's the truth of the matter. You know, if you eat this fruit, you know, you're going to know things that God, that's going to make you like God. You know, he, God is withholding something special from you. And that's the way he presents it. You know, he, he makes himself unconcerned with Eve's well-being. I'm really concerned about you, Eve. You know, don't let God trick you. Don't let him trick you. So, and the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You see, she, she bought into to be desired to make one wise. She bought into the deception. Wow, I can be like God if I eat this. And so she gives, she takes a bite and gives it to her husband and they both eat. Look at the consequences immediately of this war. There are always consequences to war. Look at this one, verse 7. And the eyes of them were opened. Weren't they open before? Oh yeah, but they were open in a new way. In a new way. And they knew that they were naked. New thought. Just five verses earlier, they, did, they were naked and did not know it. They did not know it. And immediately, the very first task that they do, they sew fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Sewed fig leaves together. I, I did a project. I taught Bible at uh, our Christian school down in Merced. And uh, I wanted the kids to experience this, so I brought in a bunch of big oak leaves. Bunch of them. Gave them needle and thread and said, make a little skirt and sew it together. Three weeks later, we barely had one skirt made because it just didn't hold together very well. It was a very difficult process. They didn't run down to the drugstore. Adam and Eve didn't run down to the drugstore and find needles and thread. They had to make the needles and thread. They had to take either the bark of the tree or something and, and pull it and, and try and get some thread out of that and to make that needle, to take the leaves. They put great effort into making clothing to cover themselves. That's a very important point. The first thing that sinful man tries to do is to cover himself. To cover 
himself. And so he sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And then they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Wait a minute. Why did they have to hide? They now had clothing. It worked for Adam to see Eve and for Eve to see Adam. It worked between them. But as soon as they heard the word of God, the word of God penetrated their covering and it made them still feel naked and ashamed. And they ran and hid themselves. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Did God not know where they were? Oh, he knew. He knew very well where Adam and Eve were hiding. But he's trying to get Adam and Eve to say, Lord, we blew it. He's giving them a chance to repent. You know, where are you? Where are you spiritually? And uh, notice the response in verse 10. Adam said, uh, I heard your voice, the word of God. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. A voice that they normally ran to for fellowship. It was a voice that they loved to hear, but now they were afraid of that voice. Because I was naked and I hid myself. So the fig leaves, how good were they? Not at all. Not at all. And then he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? God knows very well that he ate of the tree, but he's trying to get, he's trying to get Adam to confess. But we can see the consequences of the war. Look at how he responds. Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you should not eat? And what does he do? And the man said, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. Pass the blame on. Pass the blame on. The war has many side effects. Many side effects. And so he blames the woman. Now God gives a chance for the woman. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, What? The servant beguiled me. The servant. Don't take any blame for your own fault. Point to someone else. They're responsible. They're responsible. So we can immediately see the side effects of sin. And so there used to be fellowship between God and man. But that has been broken. Sin has entered in. This is in Satan's respect a win in the battle, a win in the war. He has now uh, made Adam and Eve in a fallen state. But uh, his war is, uh, is not over. It continues to this very day. When we think about what that little battle there in the Garden of Eden, what it did, we are suffering from it today. Everybody in this room suffering from it. Everyone. See, sin, all sin, gave way to all problems. Everybody have problems in this room? We all do. Every problem can be traced back to that loss of battle at the war in the Garden of Eden. All wrongs, Every wrong that is in the world, every single wrong, can be traced back to the battle in the Garden of Eden. All evil, all immorality, all decay, all failure, all weakness, all sorrow, all pain, all death, all trouble, all discomfort, all disappointments, all remorse, all regret, all hate, all conflict, 
all envy, all bitterness, all fear, all crime, all vengeance, all error, all selfishness, all confusion, all manipulation, all lies, all deception, all distortion, all war. Can you trace back to Satan's little temporary victory that he had in the garden with mankind? It's the war. And it's going on as we sit here today. But God uh, warned the serpent in Genesis 3.15. He foretold the serpent that uh, there's going to be a crushing blow. I'm going to send a savior, the seed of the woman, and he is going to crush your head. Ever since that prophecy, Satan has been heeded kill the seed of the woman and he knows that's coming through Israel and he did uh, he tried so often to kill that seed so that this would not happen he still believes that uh, he's going to maybe succeed in the end and we'll look at that when we get back to Revelation but uh, when uh, in Revelation when that seventh trumpet blows as we looked at uh, in chapter 11 in the days of the seventh trumpet, the third world judgment will be completed. The seven bold judgments are poured out. The mystery of God will be finished. The kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of Christ. And here it is, the war ceases. The war ends. So that's a uh, reason to rejoice up in heaven. But uh, when we look at this, we have to ask ourselves, Satan seems now to have the upper hand from the Garden of Eden to this very day. It seems like he has the upper hand, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Did God leave Adam and Eve and all the generations to this generation without some kind of defense, without some means of victory in this war? He's given everyone here in this room victory. And it comes through faith. Faith. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Let's say that together. Our faith. Our faith is the weapon that God has given to everyone here. And he gave it to Adam and Eve. And we'll see that in just a minute. But uh, it promises victory. No matter what Lucifer, whatever Satan, whatever the devil brings against you, your faith will give you victory. It will give you victory. It teaches you to put on that whole armor of God. It is faith that, uh, that saves you, that gets you through the tough times. It is faith that makes you an overcomer, an overcomer. So if we go back to Adam and Eve, we realize that in the garden, uh, when they were hiding, we find this passage in verse 21. Unto Adam and also his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Their fig leaves did not cut it. It did not cut it at all. So God, he made, who is making the coats of skin? God is. God makes the coats of skins and clothes them. It wasn't that God just made the coat, but after he made the coat, the text is very clear, it was God that put it on Adam and Eve. A very touching moment. A very touching moment when that garment was placed on both of them. But for that garment to be made, to get coats of skins, what had to be made? What had to happen? Yeah. A couple animals had to give their life. An innocent animal had to die so that innocent animal could clothe the sinfulness, the wrongness of man. And so we have the, the uh, first thing that Adam and Eve were being taught about uh, 
the substitution of an innocent dying for the guilty. Jesus dying for the guilty. And so he was instructing them. And so God made those coats of thin skins and he literally clothed Adam and Eve. And through that process, he taught them that there is coming a redeemer, there is coming a savior, and salvation is of the Lord. It's nothing you can do. You don't make this garment, God does. This is God's plan. It is God's salvation. And so if we compare fig leaf aprons with coats of skins, we realize that fig leaf aprons, they won't last, but coats of skins are very durable. Man-made solution, this is a God-made solution. This is minimal coverage, this is maximum coverage, but which one points to the cross? Which one is pointing to the fact that a savior is coming to save you from your sins? And uh, we know that the word of God, as soon as they heard the word of God, it did not work with the, with the fig leaves, a man-made covering. But fig leaves are still very popular in our world today. People are still making people that are falling uh, away further and further from God. They, they are covering up in their own minds a different way to make themselves right, to make themselves right. And they're nothing but fig leaf uh, coverings. They just don't work. And so uh, fig leaves uh, God replaced with a live lamb, an animal. And upon that lamb, uh, he was teaching them that he would lay on him the iniquity of us all. That day was coming. And so by faith, they, uh, they could look forward to a Savior to come. And uh, they had earthly pictures of that through the animal sacrifice. And God taught them all what that means. Because salvation is of the Lord. And that's how fellowship is restored. And that's what Satan is trying to hide from us today. So how are people saved today? Well, let's go back. The cross is central. But uh, if we look at, uh, at uh, in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve, as well as Abraham, last week we talked about Job, uh, you know, all these characters. When we look at the Old Testament and we look at us in the New Testament, how are we saved? very much the same way. Are you ready? In the Old Testament, Abraham, Adam and Eve, Job, they all had faith that looked what? Forward. Forward. A savior is coming. But it took faith to see that coming. How are we saved? By faith, but we're looking what? Backward. We're looking, it takes faith to believe that a savior saved Sarah 2,000 years ago. Sarah looks backward. Adam and Eve looked forward. But both shared the same thing. What's that word? Faith. 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 Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the one. It's a, it's a biblical truth, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. The just shall live by faith. Faith. For by grace are you been saved through what? Faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 3, actually 2, 8 and 9. And so uh, when you look at the examples throughout the Bible, we realize they all exercised faith in this battle, in the war. David, David, when he fought Goliath, he didn't know Goliath's strength. He didn't need to know Goliath's strength because he already knew whose strength? God's. Yeah. So uh, it is by faith that he knew that. And uh, the Lord taught him to say this in 1 Samuel 17, 47, before he slung his rock into Goliath's forehead, he said, the battle belongs to the Lord. I want us to conclude our service today by singing that song, uh, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. Let's stand and sing that, okay?